So quickly, aortic valve disease. Um, just moving downstream. So number A. Is this the mouse? Yeah. Okay. So um, similar story. We're going to talk about regurgitant lesions and then stenotic lesions and then not infrequently uh, mixed lesions, which will have a little bit of both. Um, first, aortic regurgitation can have several uh, etiologies that can be primary leaflet issues. It can be um, issues with the supporting structures like the root and the annulus enlarging. Obviously, rheumatic disease can affect the, the aortic valve just like the mitral valve. Abnormalities of the cusp and congenital lesions, even not necessarily valvular lesions, but even uh, like a subvalvular membrane can, can lead to um, aortic insufficiency. Infections, endocarditis, drugs, and, and some um, uncommon inflammatory processes. Again, as far as timing of the pathophysiology, we mostly deal with managing the chronics. The acutes are generally sort of catastrophic cardiogenic shock patients. The LV hasn't had time to remodel. This can be seen in the setting of a dissection. So it's so these are, you know, I don't want to say no-brainers, but they have to go to the surgery uh, ASAP, obviously. The chronics are, are the trick, um, and AR is tough because it has a combined effect on the left ventricle in that it, it has a preload and afterload ex excess, leads to dilation as well as systolic dysfunction. So, um, and, there, and there are some nice uh, sort of guidelines here, I think, for managing uh, aortic regurgitation that, that help us know when, when the right time to intervene is. So with aortic regurgitation, if it's severe, based on the criteria Steve went through and you're symptomatic, you go for surgery. If it's uh, severe and you're asymptomatic, if your ejection fraction has started to drop, you go for surgery. If you're going for some other cardiac surgery, bypass surgery, et cetera, you get a, a new aortic valve. The trick is in here. If your ejection fraction is preserved and your end systolic diameter is greater than 50 millimeters, then, and you're asymptomatic, but you have severe AR, it's, it's very reasonable, I think, to, and, and the guidelines would indicate that to uh, go for an AVR. If you're asymptomatic and you have severe AR and your ejection fraction is preserved and your end diastolic dimension is greater than 65, so 50 and 65 are the, are the numbers now <clears throat> for AR, and you're low surgical risk, then again, it's, it's uh, a little bit less strong of a, a recommendation, but, but very reasonable to go for um, surgery. If your ejection fraction is preserved and your LV is not dilated and you're asymptomatic, you, you watch them. And uh, we have a lot of patients like that. Now, if you have moderate aortic regurgitation and you're going for um, you know, some other cardiac surgery like bypass, then you, then you would get an AR. But if you're not, we monitor these people about, about every uh, six months or so with an echo, really looking out for this stuff. I mean, obviously looking out for symptoms but really looking out for any signs of the consequences of the volume overload on the ventricle, meaning uh, dilation in end systole or end diastole. Um, what we see a lot of, and, and probably more frequently, is, is aortic stenosis, and um, the various etiologies are sort of laid out here in this cartoon. Um, a normal valve here, try a leaflet. And people always kind of want to know, you know, how blocked is my valve? And like, you can say like, 90%, but they don't really get it. But if you, if you tell them, you know, a normal valve is like the size of a, of a 50 cent piece or a quarter, and yours is like the size of, uh, you show them like the tip of your pen, then I think they really get it. I mean, people don't come in and say, you know, my valve area is 0.6. You know, they come in and say, I'm short of breath, and they want to understand why. And a lot of times, if you can put it in, in sort of terms that they understand, they'll, they'll get it and be more, you know, buy into doing something about it. Rheumatic disease, and here's some, some normal leaflets here. Rheumatic disease, just like the mitral, is uh, this um, inflammatory process affects the commissures and the, and the leaflet tips and causes both um, aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency. The thing we see most common in elderly patients is the uh, calcific degenerative uh, aortic stenosis seen in the cartoon here and in this um, pathology sample. And then in younger people, um, see a lot of bicuspid uh, pathology. So here's sort of the classic uh, natural history of aortic stenosis from Braunwald showing, um, you know, age here and, and relative survival on the y-axis. So 
people are at risk and then develop sclerosis, which is sort of a pre-aortic uh, stenosis lesion, and then develop mild to moderate. And it doesn't really affect um, their survival. But once it becomes severe and they're uh, not symptomatic, it's a little challenging to try to intervene right where this arrow is because right at the arrow is theoretically when symptoms start. So classic symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, and syncope. And you can see once symptoms have manifested, their survival curve really takes a, a drop. And managing asymptomatic people um, is a little bit controversial and there are ways that help us uh, intervene earlier. One of the things is a, is a um, jet velocity of greater than five uh, meters per second we would intervene early as well as if it's a really heavy calcified valve, you should probably intervene. If it's, if it's a severe aortic stenosis and there's no calcium, there's, there's probably room, room to wait till someone develops symptoms. But once they develop symptoms, it's clearly time to intervene because you'll get uh, you'll be able to do something before the, the patient has a um, sudden death. So here is, uh, Steve, Steve I know showed this, but just remember, it's, it's pretty easy to remember these numbers. The severe numbers are really the only ones you need to remember. Greater than four meters per second, greater than 40 millimeters of mercury of a mean gradient and a valve area or calculated valve area of less than one. So four, 40, and one. I think that they've made it pretty easy for us to, to remember. Here's what is being measured uh, in the echo lab. And you can see this is a cartoon of the aortic valve. You have a pressure here, a pressure here, and a drop in pressure as you go across with an increase in velocity. That increase in velocity is picked up here. So a normal velocity across the aortic valve is two meters per second. Uh, severe aortic stenosis is, is four meters per second. So here you can see this patient has a, uh, a velocity of almost five and a half for a mean gradient of, of 92. So um, when to intervene in aortic stenosis is, is laid out again here in the guidelines. If you have um, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, you get, you get a new valve. And you know, we, you'll, you'll hear more about what's, what type of valve and how that should be done later. If you're asymptomatic and uh, your ejection fraction has dropped off a little bit, again, it's, it's time to get a new valve. If it's severe and asymptomatic and you're going for other cardiac surgery, it's time to get a new valve. Now here are the um, asymptomatic sort of uh, physiologic times to intervene. If the velocity is greater than five meters per second, and which would, would correlate with a mean gradient of 60 millimeters of mercury and your low risk for surgery, it would be reasonable to go for a uh, new valve. If you, sometimes it's challenging to really tease out whether or not someone has symptoms and we'll put them on a treadmill. And if they have an abnormal treadmill st stress test, it's again reasonable to get a new valve. Ultimate, uh, and finally, if your um, change in your Vmax is greater than 0.3 meters per second per year, meaning there's something, something's acting up. We tell people all the time, it's not, the, the, the disease doesn't progress in a linear fashion. It kind of gets bad and then there's a plateau and then it gets bad. And, and the idea is if someone's in that plateau phase, fine. And that's why we follow people every six months. But if it's, if it's, if it's, you're in one of these stages for one reason or another, we don't know how to predict it where the disease is acting up, you'd want to intervene. So if the disease is progressing fairly rapidly within a short period of time, um, again, it's reasonable to, to go ahead and, and intervene. For, for moderate aortic stenosis, you got to make sure it's moderate because if, if it's on echo criteria moderate and they're symptomatic but they have a low EF, you want to make sure um, it's just not it's not just a low flow uh, situation. So you do a dobutamine stress echo, and if they augment and and it turns out to be a severe aortic stenosis, then you get a new valve. Um, if they don't augment but you're still very you're still convinced that their symptoms are from the aortic stenosis, then again it's better to intervene because we know if you treat these people medically with um without some sort of intervention they do worse than if you had you had intervened and if they're asymptomatic and going for other cardiac surgery again it's a, it's a good time uh to intervene so one of the challenges with the aortic stenosis is that all the measurements we do um, are flow dependent and so if if you are living in a low flow state it can be challenging to determine if it's actually the valve that's the problem 
or is it your flow that can be from your ventricular or, or your ventricular function or anything else? And, and this has been known for over 500 years. So in patients with low flow AS, a low flow state could occur with a reduced EF, which is the classic one. The more challenging one is this paradoxical low flow patient. So someone with a preserved EF that has um, severe aortic stenosis, but, but a low gradient. And so uh, I know Steve showed this, but just I think this is a good sort of figure to just keep in mind. Um, and these are the hemodynamic scenarios of aortic stenosis. So the classic one is this box. You have normal flow and a high gradient. You have severe aortic stenosis. That, that's not tough. This one's not tough either. If, if, even if you're in a low flow state, but you have a high uh, gradient, you, you have um, aortic stenosis, and it needs to be fixed. The challenge is over here in the low flow states, particularly in this normal flow, low gradient patient. So this is someone who would have in the echo lab a stroke volume index of greater than 35 uh, cc's per meter squared. This is probably not severe aortic stenosis. This patient could be short of breath for multiple reasons, and we'll see. I mean, there's tons of etiologies that can give you, that can put you in this box, but really probably fixing their valve is not going to help them. Um, the other challenging group is this low flow, low gradient group. So they have a stroke volume index of less than 35 uh, cc's per meter squared and a mean gradient less than 40. And these are the people that you could give dobutamine and see if you can uh, get them up. But if not, even if they don't augment, they still do better with surgery uh, as opposed to medical therapy. So here's someone, you know, with, with the low flow that we like to manage because they have uh, reduced EF and low flow, but they have a severe a high gradient, a mean gradient of 46 millimeters of mercury. So that's someone who would do well um, with surgery. It's the challenge is these um, paradoxical low flow, low gradients, because there's a whole spectrum of etiologies. I mean, it can simply be hypertension, AFib, um, MR, RV failure, mitral stenosis, TR, that lead to this reduced forward stroke volume. And because of that reduced transvalvular flow rate and reduced ejection time, you can have what's perceived as severe aortic stenosis, but in fact, you just need to um, treat something else. So how we approach patients with low flow, low gradient S is, first of all, are they, are they symptomatic? Um, and doing a stress test on these people is very uh, low risk. And ultimately, usually treat pretty conservatively, particularly if their mean gradient's less than 25. Are they hypertensive? I mean, it's, it's simple and sometimes overlooked, but hypertension can decrease flow. So when people, and this has been shown multiple times as recently as a couple months ago in Jack, treating these, low, these paradoxical low flow, low gradient patients for hypertension actually improves their aortic stenosis, which makes sense when you understand the pathophysiology behind the aortic stenosis. And so once their blood pressure is optimized, you can reassess, and a lot of times the aortic stenosis is not as bad as you thought. And then if it is, um, is it, it, are you really dealing with uh, a severe lesion? Um, so doing a uh, dibutamine stress can help sort of tease out who really has AS and who doesn't. And then also <coughs> quantifying or defining how much calcification is on the valve. If someone has a really heavy calcified valve, the odds are it is aortic stenosis. So it would be time to intervene.